Good uh, morning still, uh, everyone. My name is uh, Jan van Acht. I'm uh, representing Deloitte. Uh, I'm a partner based in Belgium. Uh, and on the EMEA level, I'm responsible for uh, the identity services that we run. Um, personal background, primarily been in public sector actually, so very happy to see the it's me being presented right in front of me. Gives you a feel of the, the type of things that I've been working on on the government side. So the integration of it's me on the Belgian side uh, is something that uh, I've been participating in personally the last couple of years. Um, and uh, it's actually, I see quite a spillover happening from the work that we've been doing in government from Belgium to the private sector. So that's uh, a specific setting that we have on our side. Okay. Interesting, thank you. I'll continue. Very welcome. My name is Ulrike van Fenroy. I'm a uh, director from EY, from the cybersecurity community. I'm working uh, with IIM, II, IAM since about 12 years. Um, especially with uh, consumer or customer identity management during the last years uh, in the banking and the financial sector and also in the automotive sector, so I'm a little bit ambivalent uh, what, uh, concerning my, my um, sectors. So uh, I'm very interested in uh, what, you what you have presented uh, this morning. We worked a lot with uh, Gigia as we are a uh, strategic partner of SAP, and as you know, Gigia is now part of the SAP uh, company. And uh, I'm very interested in what my colleagues <laughs> have to share and uh, experiences in the CIM part, so. Okay, so my name is Gerald Horst uh, of PwC. I've been, uh, I have the privilege of working in this space for um, just about 18 years, first 15 to 16 years as uh, owner and CEO of a company called Everett, which I sold to PwC two years ago. And now I'm in a similar role as, as Jan, um, basically responsible as digital identity partner across the EMEA region. So in the last, I think, four years, four to five years, we have been focusing much more on uh, consumer identity having worked for clients like Zalando in the retail sector, uh, a wide variety of banks. Uh, not so much in the public sector, only just a little bit. Um, currently, we are involved in Scandinavia, um, working also in the public sector. But we'll talk about this experience in a minute, I guess. So, it's up to you. Thanks. So, my name is Mikko Nurmi. I come from KPMG, Finland. Uh, I'm there practice lead for the consumer identity access management. Uh, I think KPMG might be a bit different company compared to these other big fours, so that we are pretty independent countries. So every every country has like independent independent <laughs> company and and we do collaborate together but but we have kind of these centers of excellence and, and in Finland we have one of the biggest biggest uh, IAM practices in, in Finland, uh, in, in KPMG, totally. So. Okay, you mentioned that you have been working on the one hand in the governmental part, on the other hand in banking and in usual e-commerce, which is a bit different than banking. Um, is there a difference when it comes to CIAM? It needs to be, does it need to be done differently across the sectors and which are the differences? Who wants to start? I don't want to assign the answers. Yeah, shall I kick it off? Well, I think there's a, um, there is indeed differences. I think a lot of the innovations uh, are happening in the financial services, especially banking sector. Uh, of course, under the pressure of uh, legislation like PSD2, the whole what we call smart authentication part is something that's really happening in the banking sector. Um, as an example, we are working for um, Currently, I think we are doing two projects for challenger banks. Challenger banks are typically um, coming from you know, uh, the larger banks here in the Netherlands. For instance, we work for MoneyU, which is part of ABN AMRO, 100% owned. And basically, they have um, stated that they want to become a European bank by providing ease of use. So they call it no hassle. Um, at the same time, there is the legislation like GDPR and PSD2. Uh, so I think. That's where we are using a lot of innova innovating new technologies. I mean, you, you mentioned Gigia, we are working there with a combination of Fortrock, 
uh, and um, NCAP security and transmit security, <coughs> very innovative solutions. Um, but across the board, you know, we work with companies like iWelcome, which is also in the room here, um, in, in retail and in uh, um, even in public sector. And I think it's kind of, if we talk about consumer identity access management, it's kind of big subject because if, if we compare like financial services to, to retail, it's totally different field, it's totally different motives why to, to invest in consumer identity access management. Of course, there's like GDPR, uh, GDPR in the behind, but, but why you do it in financial sectors, it's probably more like you want to increase trust, you want to reduce risk and, and probably probably have a good customer experience and, and in retail sector you want to probably collect data, collect consent so you, so you can use the data and make the authentication as easy as possible. So it's kind of different, totally different case, business case behind. Uh, speaking particularly for the for the Belgian market first, um, I think the situation was a bit peculiar there. So about uh, a dozen years ago, more about 15 years ago, I think now it's time goes very fast. Um, and there was a, the the big launch of the electronic identity card, uh, to which the previous speaker already referred to. Uh, basically, a chip card that was handed over to all of the Belgian citizens, um, and that gave a, a huge boost in in digitization of the of the markets and primarily of the e-government sector. Um, so there, the, the, the government sector, public sector, took a leap ahead of the private sector and caused the rest to try to catch up to the same level of digitization of digital online services as the, the government could offer at that point. Um, now, obviously, by the government taking a step ahead, the rest was catching up, and it took quite a while still for the private sector to, to offer that same level of services. And they now surpassed, uh, I think, the government, we can, we can surely say. Um, and we see now the government trying to leap ahead again and looking for ways to better service the end user. And I think a big move that I've seen the last year and a half, for sure, is the true omni-channel servicing. So not just focusing customer identity on an online channel, uh, but how do we really cross all of these different communication channels that we have? How do we cover the last mile? How do we cover the last 20% of users that have a high resistance to using digital means? And, uh, think of elderly people or, uh, or the uh, uh, way we call them the, the digital, digilaken we call them in, uh, in, in Dutch. Uh, so the people that are not born with, uh, with digital assets in their day-to-day uh, -day -day life. Uh, how can we service them? How can we, can we operate there? And so we see a, a bigger crossover again between online channels, offline channels, and trying to create a single user experience for your users, whether they are in an office. Uh, and that we see that also happening in banks. Huh? So we did a quite a nice engagement in, uh, in the Middle East where we, offer, where we started up a digital bank, but with offices still there, because customers wanted this proximity, they want somewhere to go to and have this interaction with their bank. Um, but you first really uh, step through a number of stages and the first stage is a digital authentication that you do uh, to, to do as many of the transactions as you can online, but in their portal, in their physical portal. Uh, and only then you step through the gate and you go to an even closer and closer uh, human aspect of the, uh, the engagement. I think those kind of aspects are, uh, are the way forward and uh, where we will see things, uh, things moving. So we talked about uh, the differences between automotive and uh, retail and, and financial business or banking services. I had quite uh, some interesting projects in, in automotive banks. So there we have a little bit the, the ambivalence of uh, the financial service and all the restrictions they had. Also uh, the automotive or the retail service, uh, they are interested in collecting data as, as many as they are able to. Uh, and we had a lot of uh, strategic discussions between the banking and the automotive part, uh, how to handle all these data, how to become secure, how to become uh, uh, innovative in this, this area. So it's quite interesting what happened during the last year, especially in this kind of business. So, uh, Yeah, I think relating to that, and this is also, I mean, one of the things that I would like to get across, uh, call it the best practice or something that we've learned over the past years. 
that um, Siam is, is it's about business, right? It's about digital transformation. It's about doing business online, and yes, it's about ease of use, balancing with privacy and security. Uh, but I think a lot of uh, customers that we work with, they come with a specific request. It could be, you know, in terms of GDPR, automating consent management, or it could be doing business with a specific user group. And we feel that it's very important, first of all, to engage the business, not see it as a technology play or a solution play, but it is about engaging the business people, understanding what the priority should be, what the business case and the relevance is. At the same time, um, it's also about thinking more in terms of a strategic play, like not going for a point solution for addressing a specific requirement or a specific issue, but also looking at it from a more long-term perspective. So think more in terms of platform for Siam instead of a solution. Those are the things that we're experiencing, especially in the early days, like four or five years ago, we only were talking to, to CIO and IT people, and it was all about features. It was about competitive advantage based on features, ease of use, um, and nowadays it's much more about thinking in terms of where are you taking this, what's the dot on the horizon, and how does identity play a role there? That has changed over the past years. Is this something that you would agree upon? Really getting the business on board and get doing a real requirements analysis? What is the business about? What are the risks on the other side, but really have the business on board? It's quite necessary to have the business on board. Have, uh, and, and to have discussions on their strategy, where they want to go, what is the business model of the future, of their future, and not only to talk to the IT guys, or to the security guys especially, yes. Yeah, and we <coughs> kind of, as say, CIM specialists, we tend to talk about, about like customer experience, which CIM is about, but we are talking like, like showing some some picture about, about long registration form and, and say that this is bad. I do it myself as well, all, all the time. But kind of, as, as you mentioned, it's not like a point solution. It's about, about your, your customer experience strategy. How, are you, how, how the customer organization is implementing it. And it's about the data strategy, how you, how you uh, uh, provide the single source of truth truth uh, about the consumer information it's it's not that you can you can put some solution on top of everything and say that okay now it's now it's good now we have good customer experience now we have good data you have to integrate it in in those other other strategic initiatives uh, I think it's it, it's a big challenge at the same time uh, to involve business because uh, talking from the, the classical more IT background, it's easy to talk business versus IT. Um, but uh, as we all know, uh, IT is a difficult crowd. Uh, there is a lot of diversity, but uh, business as well, uh, of course. Um, we're talking there to, to the, the, the finance departments, marketing, pure business channels. And that's where an industry focus comes really into play. Um, and that's something that I think I've, I've seen certainly recently, that the true industry knowledge of, of, of the people in my team, that, that that becomes more and more important. That we have people that have been working in the industry with a client, that have done certain engagements in automotive, in banking, in chemicals, in, in pharma, in, in whatever industry you can imagine. But that industry angle is, is getting just that much more important. Just not that the solutions are different. I think everyone that has been named here, uh, I think we didn't name Okta yet, as a, as a, so that one on the list as well, so I'll name drop those as well. Um, but, uh, but all of them that, uh, that have been listed, they can offer solutions, but it's how do you deploy them and what, what is the real problem you're trying to solve. Um, and for me personally, the, I, I like to stay, take it a step further, and that is what is the next problem that, that you want to see solved. Eh? It's not just stop at what you know now, but where do you where do you grow to? What is what is really your change in in in, in business uh, strategy itself? In in new channels that they're trying to open up, new products that they want to to get launched. Uh, how are they organizing their back office to respond to those changing and increasing requirements of their users? And that's a, a much bigger challenge, I think, that we have and where I see my team now being just embedded within a broader business transformation effort as a cyber expert, as an identity expert, 
but we're just one of the many people involved in, in that engagement. It's not just about an identity engagement anymore. That's, that's the least of everyone worried. Uh, but at the same time, luckily, they can't do without us. Um, and luckily for us, then, and there's still, uh, still a lot of work to be done because uh, they, they need us to, to be successful. So it's integration with business, but it's also integration with many other departments within the organization from help desk to marketing automation and all this kind of stuff, far beyond the traditional IAM thing that we used to do as IAM people. But it's really much more about business, but, but also about compliance and, and legal things. Yes, and I mean, it's also, I mean, we're sitting here um, and we, I think we are even named uh, the big four. Uh, and it's, it's not for nothing. I mean, we are big firms. Uh, it's also the nature of our business because, yes, we do digital transformation, but it starts with strategy consulting. And in the end, it's consulting, it's architecting, it's designing, it's implementing, and then there's even running solutions. So we can do the whole shebang. And, I mean, that's the nature of our business, right? I mean, uh, starting from strategy all the way through execution, uh, which, which sets us apart, I think, as a big four for, uh, to a lot of other uh, more system integration focused firms or business consulting only focused firms. And one of the things, I mean, yes, we have mentioned um, uh, technologies um, that are, you can see them in the major quadrant of Gartner and you can read all the stuff about them, but please be aware there's a lot of dynamics uh, in the markets today. Uh, choose wisely, uh, do POCs, uh, understand what they really bring, and if they fit your strategic agenda, not so much the point solution that you're looking for uh, in the next six months. I think that's also one of the lessons we've learned um, in looking at these technologies from a more strategic view. Okay, any further comment from your side? Is there a common denominator across all industries that you have identified um, that is a key starting point for a CIAM strategy that, that never, never differs. From, for example, if you do traditional IAM, you always have this joiner, mover, lever thing, and people are joining a company, leaving the company. That's all the same, no matter which industry you are. Single sign-on is very important for CIAM, I guess. Uh, also for the customers, for the consumers, single sign-on. Um, okay, as a platform, or you, you mentioned not to no, build I'm, one solutions. You're, no, you're right, but you're asking, uh, is, are there specific denominators or specific uh, functionalities? Of course they are. I mean, it's, it's, it's ease of use through easy authenticating yourself. It's single sign-on. It's um, personal data, of course, controlling personal data. There are a lot of things that are now getting uh, a necessity across the board. But Jan, you wanted to come No, to, to, to complement that, it's more on the, the, the low friction aspect is, a, is an important data. How do you lower the bar for your users, for your customers to engage with you. Um, faster time to market is still an important play there. Um, and that's uh, single sign-on is, is there, is, is it typically a quick win, eh? that's low friction, eh? you don't have to uh, confront your customers with the complexity of your own organization. Um, and that's something, again, talking a bit from my personal uh, public sector background, um, if you have one real diverse uh, big sector. Uh, it's typically a public sector with a lot of different agencies and everyone around. Um, but you have exactly the same issue in, in small corporates and in banking. You have the insurance branch and loans and uh, personal banking and private banking and they're all diverted, they're all a bit separate, but how do you engage your client in a single, single way? Same in automotive. Um, you have your dealer network on the one hand, you have your corporate central assets on the, on the other hand. How do you create a single customer experience across even just as simple as two different uh, um, garages like resellers that you have that are typically independent companies? How do you bridge that and how do you create, how do you make your, your customer feel at home no matter in which garage is, uh, is ending up? And that's the same thing they've been doing for quite a while on the physical side. Eh? So they created a common storefront, a common, common logo, a common experience. Um, and it took quite a while and a bit surprising looking back maybe, but a bit surprising how long it took to get that same kind of ambition on the online world, to really go out there with a, a single client experience. I don't know how you see guys, uh, you guys oh, see yeah, that. Yeah, absolutely right. I think I'm, I'm thinking about the fact that there's a lot of, you know, a common denominator. It's the scale. It's the amount of users, right? Getting a, a, a solution that performs really well uh, for uh, 50 million accounts is totally different from getting it from getting a solution up and running and performing well for like 100,000 employees. So I think those things, I mean, scaling, interoperability, um, standard protocols, 
these things are all very relevant if you are implementing a solution in the CM space. Okay. Um, I demanded this morning in my opening keynote, um, don't be creepy, be trusted, foster trust, and, and really tell people what you're doing with your data. This is typically something that business is not looking after. Um, how do you build that into solutions that you help your customers to also cover that aspect so that they don't run away? In, in government, they have no choice. They have to come back. But in every other solution, they might go away. They change banks. They change your, their, their service provider. They change everything. Um, once they have the feeling they got sold. Um, so how do you build that into solutions? And how do you address this within your customers? Do you? <coughs> yeah, I think if we think about GDPR, it has been enforced like for six months or so, and not, not much has changed in those, those digital services. If you go to any, any, any digital service provider, be it, be it your energy company or, or some retail, retail store, uh, you don't see as a consumer, you don't see any changes. It's like you still accept those those uh, terms of conditions, you just tick a box and, and, and with that one tick in the box, you accept everything they, they want to use your data for. Mm, I think that's going to change quite a lot in near future and, and, and some companies are already like putting, putting the bar, which will be the, the, the level uh, uh, customers are expecting to have like in 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 having control over your information having control over your consents you have given and so on and actually one one very good example I, i'm not sure who has actually done that but bbc they have really nice way to 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 approach really nice approach to dialogue design and and consent consent collecting if you haven't seen that just try it out, go and uh, begin the registration process to be a BBC user, it's really nice. Okay, thank you. I would have never said that because I know who has done that. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's really good. Uh, that was Accenture, by the way, for your information. Um, <laughs> but uh, I guess, um, yeah, very well done. I think, I mean, we, I mean PwC, um, uh, our mission statement or purpose is bringing trust to society and solving important problems. So the trust aspect is really important for us, which means we have a role to consult our clients on especially the privacy and security part. But I guess it's true for all of us. Um, at the same time, that's very difficult because uh, the business case for uh, the larger CM implementations is mostly coming from the marketing side, the business development side. And then basically you start implementing a solution because uh, the, the customer wants a competitive advantage, wants to set themselves apart from the competition by introducing ease of use, et cetera, et cetera, like with uh, BBC. But we have a role, and it's co often called uh, privacy by design or security by design, starting with the fact that you, I mean, clients get it basically uh, a lot of the times for free if they implement a CM solution. The consent management automation part is already there. So this is basically what the status is right now. Uh, that when we are implementing CM solutions, we consult them on the fact that they need to be addressing, uh, especially the CISO community, need to be addressing the GDPR, PSD2 security uh, legislation as well. And this is often uh, my role in the project. So while I come in from security side and talking with our UI business consultants, so uh, it's often my role to, to make them aware of uh, privacy by design and all this stuff, content and all the GDPR actions they have to, to consider uh, while they discuss their strategy. So I think it's very, very necessary for us and it's also the ex expectation uh, to us to, to make this uh, kind of compliance of trust, uh, to bring this trust uh, in, in the project and in the implementation of a CM solution, and not only the marketing aspects. Uh, I've been, I'm going to refer to a couple of presentations and keynotes I've been given more in the, the beginning of the year during the launch of GDPR. At that moment, uh, I predicted three waves of GDPR hitting. Um, so uh, the, the first wave, uh, we all saw that one coming and we experienced it. We just need to, 
we, we want a checkbox. Uh, so we want to check in the box that somehow claims that we are GDPR compliant. No one had any clue at that moment in time what it meant. A lot of people sold full GDPR compliancy solutions, and I see the strangest <laughs> solutions on the market that uh, claim to bring you to get your company GDPR compliant in a few mouse clicks. Um, but that's just uh, the check in the box behavior, and that's a normal behavior that you have when a legislation comes up. Um, now the second wave is, is hitting, it's, it's, it's growing, eh? primarily after the summer vacation. Um, and that is, uh, the company is realizing that the whole GDPR story and getting compliant is not something that's going to work on the longer term. And just making GDPR by nature, the way it is written, the way it is, it is conceived, is not a check in the box legislation. On the contrary, it's something that you need to have embodied and that you need to live day by day and show in anything that you do. Uh, you don't know what evidence you're going to have to prov provide next week when a breach is discovered. Um, and you don't know when that breach really happened. Did it happen yesterday? Does it happen now? Uh, is it happening tomorrow? You just don't know. Um, so that's a wave of more sustainable compliance and that's where I see solutions like consent management and integrating that into the, the, the user journey, the customer journey being, uh, being perceived. Um, now, I think that we'll go through actually for a, a, another year and a half, eh? and, um, and then we will see a shift, and I think a, 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 lo a couple of early adopters are already there, where the whole privacy ID becomes a, a non-negotiable for, uh, for customers, um, so that your, your customer that is interacting with you as a company um, will not engage in business with you unless you can really demonstrate that level of trust, that level of assurance, that you are doing the right thing and that you really are in control. And I don't see a lot of movement there on the technology front at this point. Eh? We see rather a number of companies, again more telcos, uh, that are jumping ahead and want to embark on the free market for telcos and want to differentiate themselves as being the most privacy aware telco uh, on the European continent. And that's a big claim to make. Um, and that's also where they hitting their first limits, of course. It's a big claim to make. As soon as you fail, as there is one failure, your whole claim uh, falls apart. Uh, so I think that's a big struggle that we're seeing, but that will be a very interesting move when that wave takes off uh, and, uh, and where we see the market going at that point. Well, yeah, and, and uh, commenting on that or adding a little bit on that, I think what you see now, um, especially in the banking sector, I already stated that innovation takes place a lot there, is that... Um, um, Risk management systems uh, focusing on preventing fraud are actually incorporated in the in the user journey as well. So that sits in the back uh, in the back end of, of especially the new challenger banks that I mentioned uh, are using those risk management systems in order to uh, understand if things are out of the ordinary and then introduce uh, not so much a killer transaction but introduce a second factor or a third factor even to authenticate uh, the specific consumer or client at that point in time. Okay, great. Thank you. That actually was an answer to my final question. We have just uh, two minutes left or so. I, I believe it at least. If you have m one small part of best practice, if, if there are many people in the room that have CIM programs running, um, not the big ones, the small ones, what would you, for different ones, um, recommend for when they come home to lift the lid and look inside and ch what, what to check, what to change? Where should, they, where, where should they look at? Where should they start? Just a small one. <coughs> What would be a, a recommendation? You said to the second factor, or make, make sure that you are prepared for a second factor for authentication. For step I, I think it really depends on the requirements of the, of the company at hand. Um, lifting the lid, as you said, um, I don't think that's absolutely that's necessary. It really depends. Are there requirements that are um, asking for a more platform-oriented approach, or is that solution already doing everything what they want? From my side, from what I see happening right now, it's don't forget your offline channels. And don't, don't forget the fact that you will still have a human-to-human -human interface at some point in the life cycle of your customer. Whether it's during onboarding, during offboarding, having a complaint coming in, how are you going to service that client in the same way as you're doing online when, he, when you finally get him in a face-to-face -face or in a, in a vocal communication. That's my, my prime advice from that point. Anybody else? Yeah, well, probably one thing which should be checked is that is your like CIM aligned with data strategy? What I mean is that uh, GDPR kind of brings customer identity access management 
solutions. Uh, they, it changes the role of, of CIM. It becomes a trusted source. And if you don't have like your data strategy uh, and data architecture in place so that you have kind of uh, broken those silos, data silos, it, it can get messy when, when you need to uh, enforce consents. So that's kind of to check. Yeah, it's something more. In, in this in this strategy, it's not only data, uh, not only from the data side, and from the information side. I think uh, it makes sure that your information security management is the same, does the same way as uh, your CM strategy. So you should have one goal and one secure one strategy to to work on. I think. Okay, great. If I add one thing, I think prepare for data breach. Have everything prepared, all, all forms filled in, all contacts identified, where to send the information when the data breach happens, because 72 hours are very short. Thank you very much for your time. We did not have the time to answer questions, but it was a great discussion. Um, um, yeah, thank you very much. It was really, really best practices. Thank you very much. Thank you. My pleasure.